Hello, I'm Matthew Kahn, and it's July 31st, 2023, and I'm so sorry that I'm not with you face-to-face. -face. So many of my friends are at the conference, and I was so looking forward to this. This plane cancellation yesterday was a source of deep frustration, and I hope to see all of you soon. I hope that this talk is interesting, and I hope it stimulates discussion. My talk is titled Urban Real Estate Climate Change Adaptation in Asia. And please email me any comments or questions. My starting point, and I've been a little bit of a bad boy in the environmental economics and urban community because I'm a mitigation pessimist, as I will explain, and I'm an adaptation optimist. I believe that global greenhouse gas emissions will continue to rise for decades ahead. And because that means that the developing world will be consuming more energy and fossil fuel, on some level that's good news because that means that billions of people will be less likely to be living in poverty in future decades. Folks, this is a time series graph and I hope you see a linear relationship from roughly 1955 to the present. And on the vertical axis is global carbon dioxide concentration measured in parts per million. And I see a linear relationship. I don't see a curve bending. I understand that we've passed the Inflation Reduction Act. I'm a fan of technology, but there's almost magical thinking that the energy transition is gonna be easy. I think that because of the global free rider issue that the developing nations all have their own American dream, that we're gonna see global greenhouse gas emissions continue to rise, and this brings adaptation to the forefront. The reason I now work on the microeconomics of adapting to climate change is my pessimism that we're gonna reduce global greenhouse gas emissions, and I've worked with some of you on this topic. I point you to a couple of entries here. Catherine Wolfram's paper, co-authored paper, How Will Energy Demand Develop in the Developing World? talks about the scale, just the billions of people who are growing richer and have need energy to, to, to do all the things we take for granted, transportation, home heating, electricity consumption for everything we use it for. Folks, I'd also like to advertise my recent paper with Robert Wong. We document in that paper that in the even in the United States, you need land to place solar panels and wind turbines. And there's a question of what land, because land markets don't function so well in the developing world, I think there's a lot of work to be done by real estate economists on the geography of the green economy across Asian nations. We document that in the United States, red states do, especially for wind power, have a comparative advantage in generating green power because land is cheaper in Texas than in California, and it's easier to get the permitting done in red states. It's hard to do things in America's progressive states, something that Ezra Klein often writes about. And so because of my work here, and my paper with Shamik also, I'd encourage you to take a look at, I think that global greenhouse gas emissions will rise, and thus adaptation is gonna move to the forefront. I'm not gonna to talk today about Greta Thunberg, I'm not going to talk about Al Gore. I'm not going to talk to you about becoming a vegetarian or biking to work or not taking hot showers. Uh, what I do want to talk to you about is my belief that Mother Nature is punching more and more places, more and more frequently with harder punches. As the world grows richer, more of us are willing to pay more in dollars Willingness to pay from the expenditure function from intermediate micro. We're willing to pay more to not be punched by Mother Nature. Of course, many of you are going to say, okay, then let's get a global carbon tax. But I go back to the previous slide. That's not going to happen. In a world where governments are not working together to solve the coordination problem, how do private markets, private real estate markets, help to protect you and my family from the serious risks we face? I claim that as more of us seek solutions to the serious climate challenges we face, particulate matter spikes, wildfires, extreme heat, humidity, flood risk, natural disasters, flooding, capitalism steps up as the aggregate demand for solutions rises, 
some future Musker Bezos is formed. MIT is filled with talented engineers trying to think of the next big thing. Adapting to climate change offers so many solutions and careers for young people. Their best ideas are gonna help us to adapt. A strong statement. Climate resilience will become just another attribute of competing real estate, similar to nice bathrooms. How many real estate economists in searching for a home or in pricing a home and running a, a hedonic regression have talked about bathrooms and the marginal price of a good bathroom? Going forward, we're gonna see something similar. The data scientists, many of whom work with CG at MIT, are gonna come up with metrics of climate resilience. And we're gonna show there's gonna be supply and demand for these attributes. And we're gonna show that more and more people demand these attributes and this helps to protect them from mother nature's harder punches. Since global greenhouse gas emissions will continue to rise for decades, Asia's real estate will need to become more resilient. How much of this will be caused by government building codes versus developers building with better materials and better knowledge? We will see, and I wanna talk about that. A central issue is how do we protect the poor? Jeff Bezos and his children, Elon Musk and his children, they're gonna have a great life, better life than me. But for the poor who always face the greatest challenges, how do we protect them? What real estate do they live in? What public and private goods do they have the rights to, to protect them from the threats we face? And I'm gonna come back to the Boskin Report. Folks, never forget that we're economists and we're thinking about safety as another attribute that we want. So we all want to live in a safe neighborhood. Do you live in a safe neighborhood by having great cops or by having social capital or by having everyone have a gun? How do you produce local safety? In a similar sense, how do you produce climate safety? Each of us wants to be comfortable and healthy. I'm fascinated, and there's much work to be done in Asia, on the interplay between private and public investment and the game these two play. Carol Lankowski, Erzo and Richard Zeckhauser wrote a great paper that merits new work in Asia, where they studied whether private investment and government investment in protection, think of seawalls, think of New Orleans, are they complements or substitutes? Think of a case, and this, for the older economists in the room, think of Sam Peltzman and the unintended consequences of government intervention. If in New Orleans, the Army Corps of Engineers builds great seawalls or perceived great seawalls, if more people move to the floodplains thinking that they're safe, and then if the levees don't turn out to be so great because of depreciation or incompetence or stronger storms, then an unintended consequence of the government's well-intentioned actions of building infrast protective infrastructure is you crowded out private investment. Libertarian economists argue that social security crowds out private savings. This debate continues of does, when does government actions enhance private consumption versus when does it crowd out private actions? And I think that's going to be a fundamental issue going forward. I want to live in an economy where the rules of the game are such that public investments in information are a complement of private adaptation investments, not a substitute. In Asian cities today, there is a wide variety of challenges faced due to climate change, particulate matter spikes, heat, natural disasters, flooding. The good news is these are increasingly predictable due to progress in climate science. My adaptation recipe has the following ingredients. We are going to enjoy an increased access to spatially refined data. First Street Foundation is an example. Jupiter is an example. I bet these firms will branch out into Asia to teach uh, how many hot days are there expected to be in Hanoi versus Ho Chi Minh City in the year 2030. That's valuable information. It's a forecast. It has a confidence interval. Note that unknown unknowns become known unknowns as the media, bloggers, Twitter, newspapers report these forecasts. In any nation, there's a system of cities. Cities compete against each other. San Francisco had a great 20 years and now it's in trouble. I love competition. Cities compete for people and jobs. Economics departments compete for talented PhD students and faculty. Such competition helps all. For those nations in Asia that have a system of cities, like in a Korea, uh, Seoul is almost too powerful. It needs competition. A, we need those nations that have a system of cities. If Phoenix becomes unlivable, there's several hundred other cities to live in. 
there's substitution possibilities. In those Asian nations that have a variety of cities to choose from, and within those cities have neighborhoods to choose from, and within those neighborhoods have different housing suppliers building different housing, there's all sorts of permutations here creating a menu of choice, a continuous menu with almost an infinite number of permutations for risk averse people, for old people to choose what's right for them, free to choose. As my teacher Sherwin Rosen would emphasize, there's a hedonic pricing gradient that emerges and which will change due to climate risk that compensates those who take on risk. If part of Hanoi faces greater flood risk than it used to, rents will fall there and that compensates people. They are free to choose if they want to live there or not. Of course, poor people will be more likely to live there, but is that good or bad? Rents are lower, but you're taking on more risk. What gambles do we allow people to take on if they're aware of the risks? If these poor people have abilities to self-protect, if by paying low rents, they have more money to send their children to better schools, are they free to choose? Are you a benevolent paternalist who doesn't want poor people to live in those areas? And if you don't live, let them live there, in general equilibrium, where do they live? Are, do we treat people as adults? as they try to produce safety, but they trade off safety versus other goods they want given their conception of the good life. Now, this trade-off issue is not a stationary problem. And folks, here I fight many doom and gloom environmental economists. There's many economists, especially in this spatial quantitative economics field, who I've been battling because I played their work violates the Lucas critique. Many of these leading scholars, write down stationary production possibility frontiers. You even see this in Nordhaus's Nobel Prize research. My point is that the production possibility frontier of climate safety changes over time. Think of your cell phone. You couldn't have bought that 30 years ago. Think of the car you drive. You couldn't have bought that car 30 years ago. Differentiated products change over time. Of course, the housing stock is durable. But if you're in some crummy 1930s building, it'll sell for a deep discount and we're back to Sherwin Rosen's hedonic point. The optimism of Michael Boskin's Boskin report that he wrote with these great economists here is that in a capitalist economy, new varieties of products are always of higher quality with lower price per unit of quality. And this point matters more than ever because adaptation products will be of higher quality and lower price because we demand these products. That was the theme of Daron Asimoglu and Josh Lin's paper. Daron has written maybe 500,000 papers. This is my favorite paper that he's ever written. If I can crack a joke, what this paper says is, if Matthew were the only bald man in the world, we don't get rogue. But if enough men are bald and are embarrassed to be bald, and that's they're each willing to pay for hair growth products, pharmaceutical for-profit companies will do the innovation to create the product. The same logic holds for adapting to climate change. And that was the point of my paper with Dashwo. If enough of us are not climate skeptics and recognize we face challenges and face a non-stationary climate, if we demand solutions and are willing to pay for them and not free ride and out of self-interest, we have strong incentives to pay. This is not the free rider issue with carbon mitigation. We will demand houses that can withstand floods, homes that can take 110 degree heat. And Capitalists and architects and urban planners will work together, similar to Milton Friedman's pencil, to make products to help us. And this is the unsexy world of private market adaptation. So this is a slide. Many young people in the room worship the top five journals. I've published in these journals. I don't think I will anymore. So Chris Cadiddle published a very nice paper in the American Economic Review 12 years ago called Automobiles on Steroids. And folks, this is not a graph about adapting climate change. This is a graph about how differentiated products change over time. He makes, he assumes <coughs> that cars are two-dimensional. Their fuel economy, miles per gallon, is on the vertical axis and their weight, curb weight, is on the x-axis. Folks, what he's showing you is over the years 1980 to 26 years later in the year 2006, the production possibility frontier has changed. In the year 1980, if you wanted a car that achieved 30 miles per gallon, you, on average, it would weigh about 2,000 pounds. Because of changes in differentiated products, in the year 2006, if you want a vehicle that achieves 30 miles per gallon, 
it can now be 50% heavier and weigh 3,000 pounds. This is an example of how due to endogenous innovation, differentiated products change over time. Same logic holds for adapting to climate change. So if an area faces in Miami faces floods or hurricanes, new homes will have better windows to withstand the shock. There'll be profits from, buy, from selling those and consumer surplus from buying them. So much of this doom and gloom ignores the gains to trade between buyers and sellers and implicitly assumes we're in a stationary economy. Induced innovation is a key part of my optimism for the real estate sector. Now, my mother often says to me, my mother's a lawyer. My mother got into Stanford to study economics, uh, but Stanford didn't offer her enough financial aid. And so she went to Vassar, met my father, and I was quickly born. My mother keeps saying to me, Matthew, don't believe in magic. And so I don't believe in magical thinking. I believe in markets. And so I'm always looking for empirical benchmarks of adaptation progress. With two members at the conference today, today Varihi and, and, and Sahil, we've written a paper documenting using lights at night, the third paper here. We document that floods in richer countries and in more recent years, floods in a city lead to less damage, less dimming of lights at night than they do in poor nations and in previous years. We're getting better. Cities are suffering less from floods. This is a reduced form empirical evidence, especially in richer cities, and in more recent years, evidence of adaptation to flooding. Let's talk about the first paper by Karen, Olivier, Michael, Joe, and Allen. Folks, over a 90-year period, the United States has often had heat waves. When we didn't have air conditioning, more people died. These guys are graphing. These are coefficients from a regression each decade, stratified by decade, of the death rate in a given state. So there's 50 observations at each regression, and there's nine of these regressions, and they're regressing state's mortality rate on, that, on how hot it was that summer. And they're documenting that in the past, there was a more positive correlation between summer heat and deaths. It's notice that over time, the correlation has shrunk to zero. What's going on? Has our physiology changed? Their paper, Adapting to Climate Change, the remarkable decline in the US temperature mortality. What's changed? As Americans grew richer, they purchased more air conditioners. The Boskin report, air conditioners became cheaper. So there's a substitution and an income effect to buy these such that even most poor people now own some sort of cooling device. And this has attenuated the death risk from extreme heat. Of course, the homeless in Asia and the United States are vulnerable. And we can come back to that. But the overall correlation has shrunk sharply. <clears throat> and in my own work, my well-cited Restat paper, I documented how in richer countries, the death toll from natural disasters is much lower. You want adaptation to Mother Nature's punches? Embrace the economic growth agenda of reducing poverty and raising per capita income. In Korea, if a shock occurred 50 years ago when the nation was poorer than today, much more damage would take place. Yes, there's more real estate now, but, it, but if we measure things in terms of deaths or as a percentage of the capital stock, a Korea is a developed nation is much better able to withstand shocks, even as mother nature is punching harder. So there's sort of a race, we're getting punched harder, but those nations that develop suffer less from these shocks. So this is the race that fascinates me. For those of you, the older economists in the room, this is sort of Paul Ehrlich versus Julian Simon again. I wanna give a case study from Vietnam because I have a wonderful Vietnamese student in my PhD program and he's taught me so much and I can bring some Asian lessons home here about the beneficial role of urbanization in helping nations to adapt to climate change. And of course, this is a theme in my 2010 Climatopolis book. So Vietnam is a large nation of roughly 100 million people with only 38% of the population urbanized. So there's all these farmers. And of course, farming is sensitive to climate shocks. And my PhD students are studying this. I claim that a silver lining of climate change is that this will accelerate urbanization to Vietnam cities. We know that when people move to cities, that this encourages them to acquire more skill and urbanization raises their income. Cities and skills are complements. That's a key theme in Ed Glazer's work. 
It's been documented by development economists like Rob Jensen at Yale and Nolan Miller that in India, when farmers expect to send their children to the cities, they, give, they invest more in their education because they recognize that such education it has a higher rate of return in a Roy model of migration if you're in the cities. Urbanization facilitates climate change adaptation. Urbanites have more income. They work and live inside relative to farmers. And they work in industries that are exposed, but not exposed to the same extent as farming. And so the urban economy is a diversification strategy for adapting to climate change. Now, a key thing in all nations, including Vietnam, is that there be a system of cities to choose from. Two cities are Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City. In a nation like Vietnam, people are free to choose. If there are several different cities to choose from, you can kind of pick your poison. Some people move to Phoenix, some move to Boston. Location-specific weather challenges are common knowledge. In Vietnam, northern and central cities face quite extreme heat risk. Southern cities face flood risk. Different people will move to different areas, be aware in terms of subjective probability of the risk they face, and will take actions to protect their families. Uh, so we are not flying blind here. We have every incentive to do our homework before we make a major decision, investment decision, like our locational choice or investing in real estate. Now, the rich always have it better. Here's some Google photos of how the rich live. If this housing in Vietnam were hit with extreme wind, extreme rain, extreme heat, I think the residents inside would have a very good day. Contrast that to the residents of this hut, which is also in Vietnam. Of course, I understand and appreciate that the residents of this house have less of a capacity to adapt to extreme weather. Again, I ask you, how do we help these individuals? Do you help them by destroying this housing, by relocating them, or by helping them to enjoy the gains from economic development so that they can use their own resources and be free to choose to move to higher quality housing provided by the private market? So a question is, I'd like to know, is for the residents of this housing, if this is in a city, where did they move from? Why do they live here? Is it effectively because the rents are free? How long do they expect to stay here? If there's an extreme weather event, how do they cope with it if it's smoke, if it's heat, if it's flooding? What are their strategies on that day? And of course, social workers can play a role here to help the, these individuals. They've made a choice to live here. So a point I want you to take away is that there's a fundamental free rider issue with mitigating our greenhouse gas emissions. In contrast, in the case of adaptation, the invisible hand works here. Self-interest drives adaptation. All of us want to be safe, comfortable, and to raise healthy children. Climate change poses risk to producing each of these. Firms in Asia want to be profitable. In Pakistan, if there are roads that commonly flood, firms won't locate in those areas if they have complex supply chains and have inventories that have to be moved in and out and can't hold inventories. Those geographic areas that prove to be able to take a punch will attract economic growth and will be rewarded for their resilience investments. I want you thinking about what geographic areas with what types of real estate structures built with what materials using what urban planning ideas are more resilient in facing the tougher punches that mother nature is throwing, because we're going to see those be built. And for those that don't exist or for durable structures that have been built they're going to have a low price to compensate those via Sherwin-Rosen hedonic logic who choose to locate there. I claim that we are going to experiment and we're going to learn. And those good ideas that we learn through A-B testing are public goods that will diffuse broadly. The whole world faces many common challenges. How do you grow food in the heat? Uh, what is real estate that doesn't flood to the same extent? What do you put in the basements of buildings that flood? What materials do you use to avoid mold? These are ideas that we will explore. These are questions that we will explore and learn from. Folks, I wanna point you to a recent paper I wrote because I still write papers. I don't just give big controversial thoughts. In a recent paper I wrote with Daryl, Rob Metcalf and Sebastian, we partnered between Redfin, the Zillow competitor and First Street Foundation. First Street Foundation in the United States provides location-specific estimates 
of the risks of floods, fire, and heat, and extreme wind at the home level. And we documented that adaptation nudges changes home buyer behavior. And we find similar behavior in red counties, in Republican counties, and Democratic counties. And so a little bit of detail, because I'm getting close to the end here. First Street Foundation partitions homes into low risk, medium risk, and high risk. And relatively few homes in the United States are high risk. Redfin's users were randomly assigned to the treatment group and the control group. The control group did not receive information about the First Street Foundation flood scores. The treatment group did. The treatment group who were searching for homes in high risk places, when they learned that the homes were of high flood risk, they substituted and searched for safer homes. And we found a similar effect for searchers in, red, in Republican counties and Democratic counties. So in private markets, information, trusted information, changes behavior in the real estate market. We've already seen this with green certification of, of low carbon stuff, of you know, Energy Star and LEED. We're going to see similar work in real estate on what is modeled to be safe real estate. There's a question of the climate science modeling and a competition between these modelers because of the uncertainties associated with climate change. But still, I'm highly optimistic that in Asia, we're going to see the rise of pinpoint climate science similar to what First Street Foundation is doing, and the sharing of this information with economic actors who value this information before they make investment and financing choices. Folks, I wanna to return to Albert Saez's work on housing supply. There's a concern in the progressive community that what is gonna happen, they have sort of a zero sum game model in their head, that there's a finite amount of higher ground and low fire risk areas. And that the, it, so we've got a vertical supply curve and we're gonna have more demand for housing in those places. This is the climate gentrification hypothesis. It would interest me for this to be tested in Asia. And the claim is that the middle class and the poor are gonna live in risky places because we don't build enough housing in safer places. This crucially depends on the elasticity of the housing supply curve. Albert Saez argued that we don't build housing where there are mountains. Of course, I know his work and I respect it. But there's an additional hypothesis. Bill Fischel's argued that we don't build housing where there's incumbent homeowners. I've argued that we also don't build it in places where environmentalists live. We build very little housing in Boston, Cambridge, Berkeley, in all these progressive places. Going forward, in Asia, as higher ground and less risky places in a Vietnam, a Korea, a Japan, are looked at, and India are located, do the housing authorities allow more housing to be built there? That's going to play a crucial issue in determining the poor's ability to use free markets to adapt. Bottom bullet point. Given that we know that we don't know exactly what punches Mother Nature is going to throw going forward, the concept of option value is very valuable here. In Japan, the cliche is that housing isn't that durable because of earthquake risk. Devin and I, in a paper that I like, explored several years ago the idea of option value and the optimal durability of real estate when you face nighty and uncertainty and there's ambiguity about risks. You hold more of an option in a Dixit Pindike sense. For those of you who know real option theory, we're going to see a lot more work on real options because a if land, if a developer knows that he doesn't know what risk a property faces, there's a value of, of building a less durable structure, renting that thing out, then learning what happens to that property, and then either and then you can update that property, or if you've lost it to the sea, you lose less because you didn't sink such a large fixed cost up front. <clears throat> I'm an empiricist. And I'm always looking for empirical benchmarks of whether my optimistic theories hold. Here are some metrics that I would encourage each of you who studies Asian real estate to keep an eye on. While I'm a strong believer, the Asian adaptation hypothesis predicts that even in places in Asia that face rising risks, that home price and commercial prices won't crash, that REITs that hold these properties in portfolio won't crash, and that mortgage-backed securities and commercial mortgage-backed securities comprised of assets backed up by loans in those places don't crash in value. 
it, if we see more loan defaults, if we see prices decline sharply in areas, that's evidence to me that the area is not adapting to the new risks we face. If we see rents fall and vacancies rise, those are commercial towers that are not adapting. In San Francisco today, many towers are not adapting to the work from home challenge. That interests me. I claim that that's occurring because these building owners are anticipating a federal bailout, but that's a discussion for another day. And of course, I'm working on that. A pessimist would say, well, we're gonna see more insurance claims for property, health, and life insurance in places that get hit because the people are passive victims who can't protect themselves. Folks, I'm willing to bet you on that. That's the Julian Simon optimism. That's the empirical benchmark. Simon and Ehrlich had their bet. This is the new adaptation bet. <clears throat> How do we protect the poor who always face the greatest challenges and will face new challenges because of climate change? As I discussed a few moments ago, the poor, as they urbanize, there's opportunities for them, accelerating urbanization in helping them to invest in their skills, helping them to raise their earnings. Think back to Glazer's work on cities and skills. If those same US mincer curve wage regressions hold in Asia, then there's great possibilities for helping the poor to earn the income to protect themselves. And I explore that in my Asian development review piece. Dora and I wrote a paper 20 years ago called Changes in the Value of Life, where we used 50 years of Viscusi, Sherwin Rosen wage regressions to document that the value of a statistical life in the United States rises faster than the nation's GNP. If this result holds in Asia, this means that as Asian nations grow richer, whether it's a Vietnam or a Korea, then it, the, the, there will be a greater demand for safety. And this will provide real estate developers and government officials to invest in projects that increase the population's safety. Now, coming back to that paper on crowding out, it's important to design public goods investment in safety such that it crowds in private investment and doesn't crowd it out. But as the value of a statistical life rises in Asia as economic development takes place, you're going to see higher quality infrastructure, and that will better withstand shocks, and that will provide some public goods that will benefit the poor. To wrap up, knowing that I'm a controversial thinker, I check my work with ChatGPT. Will we adapt to climate change? I'd have you read this. This is a half joke. Note that ChatGPT focuses on the public sector. It, 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 there's a mixture here of public sector and private sector actions to help us to adapt. I think that the private sector is going to be the major driver of our adaptation progress. I see a fair bit of optimism from ChatGPT. I, I didn't lead the witness here. This was an open question. And this is the conventional wisdom that I don't see in the New York Times. If today, I bring you back to my two books, my controversial Climatopolis from 2010 and my recent more sober Adapting to Climate Change. These are US focused books, many hypotheses that I've alluded to here, many ideas that can be brought to Asia for fruitful research. And I hope this interests you and continues our dialogue. And I so wish I was with you today. Thank you.